This is Jay Martin. What's fundamental to the cycle of man is trust. You know, mm. money, credit comes from the Latin credere, to believe, right? There's belief. You believe that the person is going to pay you back. So trust is the foundation of society. We abdicate our own responsibility for trust because it's easy. The beauty of owning gold is, are the risks we don't take by owning it, right? And I think that's such a great way mm. to think about it. And so when you talk about opting out and you talk about all this stuff going on, the chaos around you and how risky everything seems, owning gold is a way to opt out of that. My guest today is one of my personal favorites, Grant Williams. I call Grant the smoke detector because he often sees trouble long before it started. Now, mainstream media and investors, they see trouble when it's already on fire. Grant is always way ahead of the curve, months, if not years. Today, we talk macro, geopolitics, and the gold market, and it was fascinating. I love this conversation. It's always a treat to sit down with Grant, and today was no different. I know you're going to enjoy this. Here's Grant Williams. Grant. Hey, buddy. Good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah, thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Okay, there are a uh, handful of things I want to talk to you about today. And if there was one theme that I wanted to focus on, it would be the importance of accepting that the world is unpredictable. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would argue that black swan events don't necessarily hurt people so much because they don't see them coming. They hurt people because we're ill-prepared for surprises. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that's a fair representation. I think, um, you know, what's happened, there's been a profound change in the last couple of years. And we've had this extended period of 50 years almost of dampening volatility and fewer and fewer shocks. I mean, we've had some big shocks. Obviously, we had the dot-com bust. Yep. We had 9-11, we had 2008, we've had a European debt crisis, but they've all been kind of spikes. Mm -hmm. We haven't had prolonged instability because everything's been done <clears> in periods of, of stress to dampen all that down. It's worked. Yeah. So I think we've all mm. become used to this too shall pass. And whatever happens, it's very easy to think, you know what, this is going to be a storm in a teacup and we don't have to worry about it. And we'll be saved by the central banks or the government or some, something will be done to make this go away. So we've, we've lost the the feeling that there's a need to prepare for these bad outcomes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the big changes we've seen in the last couple of years is that people need to start thinking about what could go horribly wrong. And it's not that you necessarily need to make concrete preparations for it, but you need to think through the ramifications and where you might get hurt if, for example, there's all this talk about the, reset, the great reset of the financial system. Yeah. So what does that mean and how might it affect you? Mm. And then handicap the, the, the probabilities. If you think that there's a 0% chance that, that that happens, you don't need to do anything about it. Mm. If you think there's a 50% chance, you really need to take action to, to move things into places or, or change your allocations to protect you better if that comes to pass. And that's what I think people have to start doing now is start thinking through extreme outcomes that have a non-0% chance of actually happening. And maybe not assuming that somebody else is always going to swoop in and have my back. I mean, there's a, yeah. like a dependency yeah. that's been, um, I think, very reasonably curated because as you described, you know, we've, we've almost had significantly negative events many times in the last 15, 20 years, but they haven't really occurred, right? They haven't played out within a couple of years. That's right. And so the, it's, it's reasonable to think that the future is going to play out in a predictable manner. We're going to have bumps in the road but it'll be game on back to business very in short order. Well, I mean, the other thing that people, that people think is that um, they forget that, these, that the rescue attempts are cumulative because the same method is used over and over again to perform these lower rates, more debt, QE. Yeah. And that all builds up. It's not like we throw that at it, it goes away, we get rid of all the emergency <clears throat> stuff we've done. Yeah. It builds and it builds and it builds. And that's why you know, we're at the point now where it's getting really difficult for these guys to do more of the same to rescue the system because it's built up to such a point um, that it risks, that risks being the thing that topples everything over in the end, the extent, the, the enormous amounts of debt that have been rung up. And yeah. So that's why inflation has been such a huge problem. It's the, when inflation showed up in meaningful way a couple, you know, 18 months ago, mm -hmm. it changed everything because that's the one thing that's enabled everything to happen over these last 40 years is that there's never been this inflationary. So you can build the debt, build the debt, build the debt. Yeah. And you can keep rates low. And so you can fund that debt. Mm. Once inflation's here in a meaningful way, and we've seen with what the central banks have done in raising rates so quickly and so far, yes. 
they have to fight this because inflation destroys society, it destroys stability, it destroys all kinds of things that governments don't want destroyed. Yeah. And so now they've finally got their hands tied behind the back in what they can and can't do. Okay. So it, inflation changes everything in my, in my view. So I want to drill in on, on some specifics. Now, uh, you've always been really good at spotting smoke, right? Most people see the fire, right? You have a habit of getting there first and being early and seeing the rumblings of a problem before it's something we're all noticing. And for example, I had you on my podcast maybe two years ago and you were saying to me, look, Jay, everybody in my network right now is de-risking aggressively, right? Less than a year later, that's when, you know, every speculative bubble began to pop, right? And people were getting laid out because they were overexposed, over leveraged, all of this. When the U.S. confiscated the 600 billion in U.S. dollar reserves from Russia, a lot of people looked at that as just another sanction, right? And you and a few people were saying, no, 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 no. This is way bigger than that. This is as significant as when Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard, yeah. right? Here we are today, and central banks all over the world are rebalancing their reserves. Some are selling dollars for like a basket of Canadian dollars, Australian dollars, and yuan, and many are just buying gold, mm -hmm. right? And so. What you identify is that we see an event happen and most, I think, media pundits identify it as an event, but you say, no, that's precedence and it's gonna cause a trajectory. And here's where that trajectory can lead to, Yeah. right? Now, what catches your eye today like um, that's, that's boiling under the surface that is not being noticed by mainstream, but is going to become significant in, in your view? Well, one thing I've, I've noticed, um a lot, and you and I have talked about this a bit recently, is the number of people who are saying to me now, I'm getting paid 4.5% to wait. To sit in the US two-year treasuries, I'm getting paid 4, 4.5%, four and, yep. and I'm happy to sit and wait and get paid 4.5%. Yes, it's still a negative real rate compared to, to where inflation is, but this is more about risk than if covering inflation costs, right? Okay. People, are, people are thinking the world is a riskier place, and the... The last few years, as I've said to people before, if you've been invested the last few years, you got rich. Yeah. And now it's about staying rich. Yeah. And the markets... Which is arguably the harder part, right? It is. It getting is getting rich or it's, staying rich? It's weird. Ones? Yeah. It, it's, it's such mm -hmm. a great point because what happens is when you're trying to get rich and you get rich, two things happen. One, you think it's all down to you and you think right. you're a genius, right? Yes. So, hey, if I made all this money over the last two years, think how much money I can make. Now I've got a bigger starting point over the next few years. Yeah. Um, no, stimulus, lower rates. There's a whole re lot of reasons why everything's gone up. Hmm. Um, and so once you, once you do that, once you, once you get rich, you also think that can go on forever. Of course. And it normally takes a shock, which is why these shocks happen the way they do, which is why 2007, eight happened, right? It, 2008 is where most people put the financial crisis to because that's when Lehman went and Bear Stearns went yeah. and all the headlines hit. Right. But it started 18 months before that. And if you were in the markets and you were paying attention, you could see this stuff happening. Um, so most people have got rich if they've been invested, they're richer. They've made some serious money in the last couple of years, particularly if they held on through COVID, which a lot of people didn't. They got panicked out at the lows. Um, but the pros mm. are now saying, look, the world's a riskier place. The, the, the danger of something going wrong when markets are at these levels is enormous because there's such a big air gap between here and any kind of long-term trajectory for markets. So I want to be careful, I want to be patient. So I've really noticed that. And in fact, um, I, I talked about this a little bit the other day and the next day I see Jeff Gunlet talking about patience. I see Howard Marks saying literally, I'm okay getting paid four and a half percent to sit and wait. Yeah. And so I think that's that's a big shift because what that means is the smart money is is pulling back to the sidelines. Now they'll deploy as and when they see a good opportunity, mm. but they're happy to just sit out for a while, and that takes a bit away from the market. That takes um, you know some some stocked up buying power away from markets because it's gonna it's gonna take more to tempt them out of four and a half percent returns. Yeah. Than it would out of zero. Of course. And I think that's a big shift. Right. And so therefore, could you speculate that if we're in a secular bear market in the broad equities, and we're going to see bear market rallies along the way, nothing goes straight up or straight down, right? Yeah. And if we continue to see, as we're kind of seeing right now, maybe a bear market rally on the way down, it's tempting retail back in, right? Because you could think you're buying the dip, right? And buying the dip's a strategy that's worked for a really long time. So let's use that game book. 
And then when you experience a bit of a rally, your convictions increased because it turns out you're right, right? And you're getting set up to be let down again. But those dips, I mean, those bear market rallies, would they decrease then in, in energy and significance as institutional funds, as smart money is pulling out and it's just a few retail players playing that game? Is that how we get to the bottom? Well, look, what bear market rallies do is they offer patient bears the chance to sell more. Right. Patient bears the chance to sell. It, when you more. get these vicious bear market yeah. and if you look at what's happened, for example, in January, here we are, beginning of February, um, the Nasdaq was up maybe eleven percent in January, I think. Mm -hmm. The S and P was up three percent. And so you look at right. you look at what's leading this, and it's all the crazy names we saw. Right? Yeah. It's Tesla. It's the tech stocks that have been beaten down. It's yeah. Ark. It's GameStop. It's it's all these really speculative stocks, um, and you can see people have kind of caught wind of this market and that, that's it this, that was another dip to buy and away we go but the patient capital is sitting there going i go back to 2001 and i was i was listening to my friend mark Spiegel talk about this recently he said look go back to that the nasdaq was down big in in 2000 january it was up 11 percent it finished the year down 22 mm percent -hmm. um and that was not 2001 uh, uh, 9 11 sorry you know it, it, the market actually finished above where it closed on September 10th, 2001, okay. at the end of the year. So you do get these bear market rallies and they're vicious and they will do everything they can to convince you you're wrong, everything's fine and, and away we go. But you just yeah. have to kind of look at the tea leaves and look at, okay, what's moving? And that's the most important thing we're seeing here. It's speculative, high, um, highly overvalued tech stocks. It's Tesla. It's the one day to expiry options volume is a significant portion of all the options activity that's going on. It's speculation again. Mm. And that is the sort of thing that professional investors look at and that stops them getting sucked into this. It's like, okay. Mm. Now before, um, and Stan Druckerman told a great story about this. You know, he famously lost a whole bunch of money for Soros's quantum fund in the 2000, 2001 tech bubble. Mm. And he'd been saying, this is rubbish. It's a bubble. I'm staying out of it. I'm staying out of it. And two young guys who were trading the tech book for quantum were making money hand over fist. Druckerman eventually dives in right before it collapses, loses a billion dollars. And he was interviewed a number of years later by Ken Langone. Um, and Ken said to him, you know, if you famously did this thing, you lost a billion, billion dollars, what did you learn from that? And Stan said, I learned absolutely nothing because I knew I shouldn't have done it in the hmm. first place. I just got sucked in. Now we have, hmm. like I said to you before, it, it's much tougher to suck people in if they're getting paid four and a half percent to be patient. Yeah. And that's why that I think is a big change and why it's important to, to, to recognize the mindset shift that that four and a half percent free okay. uh, return is, 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 is doing yeah. to people. Okay. Last question on the markets and then I want to pivot to some geopolitical stuff. Speak to my, my retail investor audience, Grant. They're listening to this conversation. They're watching these bear market rallies. What advice or counsel would you have for somebody right now who's been in the habit of thinking, I've always got to be allocating cash, you know, catching the rally, buying the dip. I've got to put my money to work, right? Yeah. That's been the methodology, right? I've got, got to put my money to work. What would you say to that investor right now, given the state of the markets and very, the economy? Yeah, very simple. You don't have to put your money to work. I mean, it's, 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 it is that simple, really. Um, it's that simple. You know, in 2007, right before the markets fell out of bed, if you had $10 million sitting, maybe you sold a business or inherited a trust fund, whatever, you had $10 million and you put it all into two-year treasuries, you got paid half a million dollars a year in income. Mm -hmm. You don't have to touch your capital, you're earning half a million dollars a year in yeah. interest. You can live a very nice life, everything's great. Three years later, two and a half years later, that same $10 million in that same two-year treasury earned you $13,000 a year interest. Right. So that's how your life changed. Mm -hmm. Now it's going back the other way, mm -hmm. right? And so you've had all this long period of time where you've, you sit and you look at your bank account, you look at your interest statement and go, I'm earning nothing on this. Right. But if you've done okay in the last few years in the markets, your capital should have accumulated more. You should have sure. more money now than you had a couple of years ago. So actually just do the exercise, take a look. Okay, if I get paid four and a half percent on this mm -hmm. interest a year, for no stress and no aggravation and no risk, and I can watch everything unfold and look for proper entry points that aren't speculation, what am I getting, what's my return gonna be? And you're right. gonna be very surprised at what it is. And for a lot of people, it'll be enough for them to just say, actually, I don't wanna take this risk. Now, if you're a speculator, if you, if you wanna speculate and you understand that that's what you are and what you're trying to do, 
have at it, right? I mean, there's going to be plenty of volatility, <clears throat> which is a speculator's dream. Right. Um, but, you know, we've had a period of, of, of decreasing volatility for such a long time. And so the yeah. pro-volatility traders haven't really had much to do. All the guys I know who are really experienced traders are licking their lips about the amount of ups and downs they're going to see to trade over the next few years because inflation's back. Yeah. And so whether it's interest rates or currencies or equities, there are going to be moves that you can trade finally instead of just these kind of long trends. Yeah. Um, so you're going to be pitting your wits against professional traders now who are kind of come out of the woodwork and say, this is great. That's very important because that is it a is. seductive game to get pulled into. And we've seen a lot of that too, where, yeah. you know, swing traders, they're identifying as investors, but they're trading like traders, right? Yeah. And uh, it's seemingly a game that anybody can play. And, uh, you know, I guess uh, there's been a bit of success, enough success. There's been a lot of success, you know, and it, and it reinforces. That's as I thing. said, you know, and, and our mutual friend, Rick Rule, I don't know if it's his phrase originally, but he's used it enough that I think he, he owns it now. Hmm. He always says, don't confuse brains with the bull market. Yeah. And he's absolutely right, yeah, right? Exactly. And, we, and we all do it. Everyone, yeah. everyone does it, right? We all look at um, positive returns and great performance and go, I'm a genius. Yeah. And when things go wrong, we go, ah, the Fed, or how could I have seen that coming? Or what, yeah. you know, what could it be? Um, and, the, and the truth is, you know, luck plays just as much of a role in making money as... as being smart and things can go up that's right for completely different reasons than you expected them to yeah and you think hey i got that right and it's tough to just recognize really tough. i got lucky let's take cash really off the tough. table and take the win right and yeah, yeah not double down because there was a lot of uh serendipity to that win. exactly right hmm. yeah so safe to say grant that you know you're you're saying right now there's a shift in how investors should look at the market maybe there's a shift from speculative growth stocks to real value. There's a shift from speculating on capital gains to looking for yield, right? Is that? Yeah, I think that's, I think, and I think they're, they're all very smart things to do. Right. Because if you look at the, the extremes that these things have gotten to mm -hmm. um, in both directions, there is, there's money to be made in, in being patient. There's money to be made in switching out of um, things that are very overvalued. And, and what happens when you, when you get real interest rates like we're seeing now, is the overvalued stocks are the ones that correct the hardest because you yeah. can suddenly earn these kind of returns yeah. and you don't have to pay, you know, Tesla, one of my uh, favorite stocks to look at as a barometer for sentiment, is okay. trading on 60 times earnings. It's mm. a car company. And, mm -hmm. and you've had this tailwind of being able to describe it as a software company for the last few years. Yeah. And so it's being priced as a software company. But at the end of the day, it's a car company. And car companies trade on six times not 60. Sales, not 60. Yeah. So it's 10 times overvalued, yeah. potentially. Now, the truth lies probably somewhere in the middle. Yeah, good point. But let's say it goes to five times overvalued, the stock's getting cut in half. Yeah. And so you, right. you need to think about what, what having a real cost of capital, along mm -hmm. with real interest rates, what a real cost of capital does to how people invest. It changes an awful lot of things. Yeah, and you get into the psychology of investor sentiment a little bit there, right? Where we've been watching pop culture merge with finance and out of that there's born all this crazy yeah. stuff like meme stocks and you know holding on for dear life as a strategy right fomo as a driving force to enter the market and then betting on charlatan ceos because of their brand right and not looking at the underlying asset yeah. that they're driving well we've, we've had a great uh, example uh, amc famously released this ape stock right yeah, which is basically right. the same stock they could they run out of shares they could issue they came up with this cockamamie way of releasing more shares. Hmm. Ape and AMC are essentially the same stock and they trade something like $3 a part, right? Okay. And they announced, they were board meeting last week, I think it was, and they announced they're basically gonna merge the two shares. So a lot of pro traders have just had the Arbon. They've been short the expensive one, long the cheap one, because they know when that closes, yeah. they just pick up $3 in the middle. And on, the, right. hmm. on a $5 stock, that's a really pretty decent return. Yeah. Once they made this announcement, retail traders went out and just bought the wrong one. They just went and bought the, the first of all, the gap stayed as it was, yep. which it shouldn't do, it should close immediately. <clears throat> and there are pros sitting there going, this is just li literally free money, the closest thing to free money I'll ever have. Yeah. And there are, uh, are investors out there that still have this bee in their bonnet about, you know, evil Wall Street guys screwing them over in meme stocks and they're doing the wrong things. And ultimately it won't matter. 
right? And that's not to say Wall Street is a paragon of virtue, which it absolutely isn't. I spent 35 plus years inside Wall Street. I know yeah. exactly what Wall Street is, yeah. and they have an awful lot of valid points to make. But if something becomes a crusade the way it has, and it just becomes this emotional um, cause that you have to try and fight, if you're doing that in a game that revolves around numbers and mathematics, it's a really dangerous thing to do. Yeah. Um, because this is not only a game that revolves around numbers and mathematics, it's heavily regulated. There are, there are all kinds of rules yes. that it's easy to come into and go, hey, we can, we can screw the suits and we can do this and run these shares up. There are plenty of ways that they can let you do that and make money on the other side of it and just mm -hmm. wait until you run out of patience. So you know, it, it's, it's, I think it's important mm -hmm. to realize as well for, for retail investors that with the best will in the world, you're outgunned in terms of experience, in terms of knowledge, in terms of understanding how markets work. Yeah. Um, and so you need to recognize that. And that's not to say you don't have an ax to run and a lot of it is correct, but if you're gonna put your money on this and you know, would you go and sit and play poker against the World Series of Poker Champions exactly. for, for real money? Yeah. You wouldn't. No. Right? I mean, you might do for fun, but you're not going to put all your money on the table because you know this guy knows what he's doing. Yeah. And that, I think, is, is what, um, you know, markets becoming this thing that welcomes everybody in and gamifies it. And we do all these things to make markets attractive. Yeah. Um, you just turn it into a big casino. And there are whales at the table who yeah. understand how who are rules competitors. Understand I mean, it's important yeah. to recognize what that is. That's competition. Yeah. And, and I'm knowing the odds, right? If you, go, mm -hmm. if you go into a casino, the smart guys know the odds for yeah. every hand of cars they play, and mm -hmm. the tourists go in and they go, hey, let's you know, bet, bet on red or bet on black yeah. without knowing the odds. And right. so understand mm -hmm. that because it's, I think when volatility comes back as it does and when things change and, and real financial rules reassert themselves because you have a, a positive cost of capital, it's time that when the pros are gonna make some serious money. Yeah. And it's crushing if they take it out of the pocket of retail. Let them take it out of the pocket of each other. Great, great point. And you're right. When, you know, I've, I've tried to apply this to my portfolio. If I'm looking at allocating some cash and I can't identify what's my competitive advantage, yeah. right? What do, I, what do I know based on what I do for a living, who I know, you know, where I am, that I know that the market doesn't because Every time you're buying something, there's a disagreement that's occurring, right? Whatever Correct. you're buying, somebody else is selling, and you're buying because you think the price is going up, but why does, why does the other side think the price is gonna go down? Yeah. And if I don't have access to better, higher quality, more information than they do, then what, what am I doing here, right? Well, look, your, your best bet, if, you, if, you, if what you say is true, which it is, I don't think the price is going up, your very best bet is the guy on the other side of you has made his money and wants to get out. Yeah. Right? He doesn't necessarily think it's going down, mm. but he thinks it's run its course. Yes. Right? So that's your best outcome. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So yes, you're, you're, people need to think about that. It mm. is a two-way market and there is always a seller for every buyer. We've seen retail driving a lot of these stocks higher simply because in the, in the markets that you see, the equity markets, they're overwhelming um, the options guys. They're buying one day to expiry options and, it, and doing these gamma squeezes that it, it, there's no point in getting into them now, mm. but it's just a way of forcing options traders to buy more shares to cover their exposure. Right. But at the end of the day, I'm telling you, the pros are going to win those. You're going to, for every Archegos that you blow out the water, there's another hedge fund that's making tens of millions of dollars right. on this. Right. Um, yeah. And so as long as everyone's getting paid because everything's going up, it's kind of okay. But mm. when things start going down and people are, you know, losing all the money they've made and, and you know, selling their, I've seen people selling their houses to buy more Tesla shares it's because terrifying. the stock's down. Yeah. It is terrifying because that behavior has been reinforced. Yes. Um, and times are just so much more dangerous now. Yeah, it's not a team sport. No, Maybe it's that's not. the rule here, right? Yeah, it's a very competitive not a strategy. Sport. Herd mentality hurts you. This Great isn't a point. team sport. And uh, there's competitors out there that are, yeah. Okay, so look, I want to pivot into... Um, some geopolitical threads that I've heard you speaking a ton about, we've spoken briefly about them, but getting back to one of my first comments about how you qualified the confiscation of the 600 billion in US dollar reserves compared to how most qualified at the time. And I'd say that your perspective being this is precedent and it sets a trajectory and sends a message to central banks every year, everywhere that what you thought this asset was is no longer what it is, yeah. being US dollars. And we've, we've since seen the impact of that, which I, which I discussed. Since then, and more recently, we've begun to see uh, oil for gold deals and oil for yuan deals, right? So 
Walk me through that picture right now. What's occurring with the, I guess, monopoly of the U.S. dollar as a world reserve currency? Yeah. Are we moving towards a, a multipolar currency world? And, and what does that look like? Well, let's, let's, let's go back to 1973, because that's where this kind of stems from, right? Sure. In 1973, Bill Simon went to the Middle East and he signed a deal for the Nixon administration to, with the Saudis to basically the agreement was, we'll pr provide you protection we'll sell you all the arms you need because this is a rough neighborhood. Yeah. And in return, you will only accept US dollars for oil. Okay. And at the time, Saudi wasn't the only game in town, but it was the big player in terms of the oil market. So yeah. what you essentially did at that point was you cemented a demand for dollars in every country in the world that imports oil, which is a significant number of countries, right? So everyone that yeah. wanted to import oil had to pay for it in dollars, so had to keep dollar reserves. Yes. Um, and that has allowed the US to print dollars for mm -hmm. years because there's always this bid for them around the world by anyone that uses energy which is everybody yeah um and it's given the dollar its so-called exorbitant privilege yes it's allowed the dollar to become the world's re reserve currency and what we've seen in recent years is a move by oil consumers and producers to strike deals bilaterally that allow them to transact oil in their own currencies so mm -hmm. the russians don't want to have to pay for oil in dollars. They don't want to receive dollars because not. they're in danger of getting kicked out the SWIFT system. Yeah. They've had their assets, their dollar assets seized mm -hmm. um, or frozen, I should say. Mm. The Chinese don't want to have to go through the dollar. They're like, well, if we can pay for our energy in Yuan, mm -hmm. we can print the Yuan to pay they for our energy, right? Which, which solves an awful lot of problems. Yeah. So this has been a desire for many, many countries for a very long time mm -hmm. to, to find a way around having, having to pay for things and all, having to hold dollar reserves. And it wasn't a problem until the US started weaponizing the SWIFT system. The SWIFT system is this interbank network that every single dollar transaction on the, pla on the planet has to go through. Mm -hmm. And so the US has a stranglehold on that. If they kick you out of SWIFT, you cannot transact in dollars. Mm -hmm. So here's the two problems, right? I have to import my energy in dollars. Mm -hmm. The energy is what makes my economy grow, makes my citizenry warm and be able to eat food. But if the US decides I'm a bad guy, I can't transact because I can't transact in dollars or I can't buy oil. Yeah. And this was kind of a, a, a threat, but it was never really used. And then more and more in recent years, the US started sanctioning people via SWIFT. Um, and they did it because it's a very effective way to sanction people, right? If you, of course. If you take away their access to the world's reserve it's currency. Literally out in the pail. It's yeah. a fantastic sanction. And so they've used it more and more and more. Hmm. And as you saw this happening, as you saw the, the, the willingness they had to use SWIFT uh, increase, you could sense that people were starting to figure out that they were at the mercy of any kind of capriciousness on the part of the US Treasury. Fast forward to, to Russia going into Ukraine and, and in, the, in the first couple of days, there was talk about kicking Russia out of the SWIFT system. Now, it came to pass, they said, we're not gonna kick them out of the SWIFT system. And then two days later, the Treasury seized or froze the central banks, that's $600 billion of Russian assets that were sitting in dollars. Um, as soon as that happened, as soon as that decision was made, every single central bank in the world that holds dollars, that transacts in dollars, which is everybody, because that's the energy currency. Yes. If they weren't sitting there thinking, okay, how do we prepare? You know, you know I've been talking about how do we prepare ourselves. Every central bank in the world, I think, how do we prepare for a day when we might be perceived to be on the wrong side of the United States? Absolutely. Maybe they demand that we form a coalition to invade Russia. Yep. Maybe they demand that we sanction Russia and yep. Russia is our primary source of energy. And if we don't join those sanctions, do they freeze our reserves? We, we don't know. We don't know and precedent's now been set. Exactly. And yep. it's not a chance we can take. And that's the important mm -hmm. thing. It's, this is not a chance we can take. We can't think, oh, they wouldn't do that to us because this is national security. It's now. always easier the second time. Exactly right. Yeah. So, so as that's happened, this, this process that's been 10, 12, 15 years in the, in the making, mm -hmm has accelerated. And we saw um, last year a record buying of gold by central banks, yeah. um, you know, which is a way of diversifying out of dollars. Yeah. And as you say, we're seeing an awful lot of deals being struck between the Saudis and the Chinese and the Russians and the Chinese and the Iranians and the Turks and all these countries in that part of the world yes. that want to transact mm -hmm. with each other in the most vital commodity of all, which is energy, yeah. are finding ways of doing that without the dollar. Now, the payment rails are all being put in place, so it's possible to do them. And, and here's where the, the headline, being able to understand the headlines and where they're going rather than what they say is important. Okay. Because you're seeing headlines saying, you know, this, this tiny deal has been struck between 
where the Russia and the Chinese for, for sure. to trade oil in rubles or yuan. Yeah. Um, and people say, well, it doesn't matter. It's a tiny little deal. Yes. But what they're doing is they're putting the rails in place that mean we can do this. We yes. can now. It's possible. Yeah, we've only done it in a tiny amount, but it's now possible for us to send you yuan or send you rubles and get the oil in return. Yes. Now it's just a question of scale. Now it's the trajectory. That's the backup plan, right? Yeah. It's the backup generator. So if now the US uh, kicks us out, there is a way we can do this. We may have to figure out how we do it at scale, but it's possible. Um, now, is it not also, when we talked about oil importers, is it not additionally in the best interest of some oil exporters who are selling oil for, for sure. a depreciating currency? I mean, you're selling, in theory, a finite resource for, sure. for an infinite one in, in some ways. Yeah. And this is where gold comes in. You mentioned, you mentioned a short while ago that there have been oil for gold deals. And yeah. you know, Ghana, in particular, is, That's right. is, is exchanging gold for oil, which again, right? Because all these currencies are depreciating. They're yeah. all depreciating in value. Um, and so if you're exchanging any, co any commodity for fiat currency, it's really a bad trade. It's a great trade in the here and now because you need the cash flow. Yeah. But if you're thinking about having oil in the ground, which has a present value and will increase in value as time goes by, yes. and exchanging that for fiat currency, which you know is going to depreciate over yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. It's not, deal. it's not a great trade, no. right? So if you, if you, if you realize that the, the pace of depreciation is picking up, if you realize you are potentially hostage to a capricious overseas agent, yes. what do you do? You diversify, you don't want to have as many dollars. Mm -hmm. And it's happening at the margin, but it's happening. And people happening. are, let's say someone takes their dollar reserves down from 60% to 55%. Mm -hmm. That 5% that they've reduced their need for dollars is still 5% more dollars that the US has to finance somehow because the deficits are so big. That's so right. when they're going through- They need to find that 5% somewhere else. They've got to find else. that 5% somewhere else. So yeah. not only are right. they, have they got 5% coming back to them, yeah. they've got to find another 5% to take it up. So really every dollar counts double. That's interesting. So, so it, 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 yes, it is happening at the margin. And yes, anyone that tells you this is a really small thing right now and people are trying to do this, but it's not really happening. It's, it's all true. It's all true. Okay. The question is, what happens in future? And is there a tipping point where mm -hmm. 55 small deals actually start to matter? Yeah. Or is it 155? Here, or is it two? We don't know. Yeah. But mm -hmm. gradually, the demand for dollars is being chipped away at. And, yes. um, and it's important. It's important because this is national security, as I said, and it's energy. And these are two things that every yeah. country cannot do without. Okay. Now, spun out of that what is the downside to the United States? And at what point would you expect, you know, we've weaponized SWIFT, what gets weaponized next, right? Uh, what's the tipping point where the US says we need to step in aggressively and take measures that involve some kind of a hot war activity, right? Would you expect that kind of reaction? Yeah, look, I think um, the, the, these kind of shifts, uh, as our mutual friend Brent Johnson talked about this last week, they don't happen peacefully generally. right? Um, what that means is, is hard to say. It's because this isn't a team sport, is it? It's not a team sport. Yeah. Um, and, and look, there are a whole bunch of countries uh, east of the Greenwich Meridian that feel they deserve a bigger and higher seat at the table. And they're probably right. Yeah. And for many, many years now, you know, the US has been the hegemon. The US has the biggest army, the biggest navy in the world. It's the, it's the and it was the biggest customer for a long time. And it was the biggest customer. Now the US is net energy exporter. Yeah. So the US is pretty self-sufficient from these things. So how does it wield the stick to keep these countries in order? And yeah. that's where China comes in because suddenly these countries can turn eastward yes. and find a partner that may actually in the, in the not too distant future be a better partner for them mm -hmm. than the US because the, perhaps their aims and their goals are aligned slightly better yeah. than they are now with the US. Now, that's not to say that'll happen, right. but suddenly but you know, for, for a group of countries that have had their necks craned in one direction, they're kind of being, you know, it's that meme of the guy with his girlfriend and his, she's looking at him and his, his head's turned at the girl. <laughs> that's, there's a real life version of that going yeah, yeah, on yeah. There, right? And the US is over here yes. and China's over there. And in the middle are all these Asian countries that have kind of looked westward mm -hmm. instead of in their own neighborhood. And as the world deglobalizes, and that's clearly happening, you know, this idea that you're going to have a, a Middle Eastern region and an Eastern region and Japan and China and Korea are going to come become much better trading partners. Where does that leave the US? Mm -hmm. 
you've got Europe in the middle, which is you know 550 million people. It's a huge block because yeah. they're all wealthy and wealthy countries. Do they start being pulled in the orbit of China? Does does China suddenly look like a better uh, mm -hmm. counterparty to them? Interesting. It's hard to see. So the U.S. is is trying to hang on to people uh, and trying to kind of solidify its place that it's never had to do before. And so if you do that with the stick and not the carrot, when the other, when your adversary is very definitely offering the carrot with all these loans, the other Belt and Road Initiative, yeah. Oh, yeah. there are plenty of carrots being thrown out yeah. by China to Absolutely. say, hey, listen, we'll fund your infrastructures build, we'll do this yeah. for you, we'll do that for you, we'll set up swap lines of our own. Sure. Sudden, so suddenly there's another player in town. And, it, and it, again, it gives people decisions they have to make. Mm -hmm. And who knows what geopolitical deals will get done to try and maintain the status quo, and they will, because nobody wants the status quo to end except the people who don't benefit from it. Yeah. Um, but there are some real decisions for countries to make now in terms of, okay, we know where our bread has been buttered in the past. Yeah. Is it going to be the same for the next 50 years? Yeah. Or should we start cozying up this way a little bit more? Because the chances are, even if it's China gets more in the ascendancy. It doesn't have to overtake the US as hegemon. And I doubt the Chinese would want to be the global superpower. Yeah. Right. But we have to hedge our bets. Yeah. Yeah, we have to hedge our bets now. Interesting. Now, okay, so um, Jim Rickards plays devil's, devil's advocate to this concept, largely based on China's demographic problem. Yep. And he's stating sort of that China's got to swing for the fences now because the clock's ticking on their demographic crisis, right? They've got to solidify these new relationships now. If they're going to take Taiwan, they have to take that now because they know in the future, in, in his opinion, they're only going to get weaker from here on out because of their demographic crisis. What do you, what do you think about that perspective, that China is a declining nation because they're getting very top-heavy from an aging yep. population, more people drawing on resources than contributing, right? And does that compromise this picture at all, or how do you factor that in? Look, it definitely, de demo demographics is destiny. I can't remember the name of the guy that said it. He was an, I looked into it once, he was an incredibly objectionable human being, but that's besides the point, the quote still stands. Uh -huh. um, and, and, and absolutely, that is a factor. You know, I, don't, I don't know that, um, that, that China needs to take Taiwan because their demographics are weakening. I don't think taking Taiwan moves the needle from mm. that, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think the key point here is to understand that all these things are now possible. This comes back to what we've been saying from the very beginning of this conversation about recognizing what's now possible. Because two, three years ago, the idea that China would invade Taiwan was on nobody's radar. No one was talking about that. There were a few people that said, hey, you know, there's this reunification thing and the Chinese definitely want Taiwan. But they had this kind of uneasy peace and, and the, the, the Taiwanese agreed not to kind of rattle their sabers. And there were a few little political parties that made reunification is never going to happen, and some that said it was. Yeah. But it was never on anybody's bingo card. Right. Putin goes into Ukraine, and suddenly, overnight, people are saying they are definitely going to get, take Taiwan. It's going to happen yeah. in the next 18 months. Sure. No, they're not definitely going to take it, but the possibility and the probability that they could mm -hmm. has gone up mm. in people's minds. Mm -hmm. The chances are the, the Russians crossing the Ukrainian border didn't really affect the odds of China taking Taiwan. At that day, with the day that happened, it didn't change the odds whatsoever. Yeah. Watching it unfold will gradually shift the odds because the Chinese will certainly be watching the response from the West and watching how the Russians handle it. So you know that they're evaluating this in real time. But the, the ban on chips sales to China, now that is something that absolutely could escalate Yes. the chance of wanting to invade Taiwan, right? right? But that's not a headline that everyone's reading in mm. the, you know, the USA Today. That's not on the front page of USA Today, whereas all the stuff going on in Ukraine is. So probabilities and possibilities are changing all the time. And we have to be aware that most of these probabilities and possibilities that are changing are for bad events, right? The, the possibility of cold fusion is also increasing, right? Which is fantastic mm. for the world. But most of the problems are geopolitical. They're mm. driven by the fact that just about every country in the world is broke. Yeah. Many countries are facing demographic challenges, the same as China. 
Um, you know, the US is on one of the kind of bright spots in the demographic picture in the world, in the, in the developed world, certainly. Right. Um, Trending the right way, though? Are we sort of 40 years behind that crisis in, in China and Russia? What, yeah, but what the US has going for is, is, is immigration. Right. And that's right. become a yes. huge hot Absolutely. button. You know, I, I, yeah. I moved to Japan in 1989 and Japan is famously against immigration. It's, the immigration laws are tough. It's very difficult mm. to emigrate to Japan. And when I moved there in 89 to work, we knew that 25 years hence, the population was going to start declining unless okay. they did something about immigration policy and, and allowed young people to move to the country and start families and do all yeah. the things you need to do to, to change that trajectory. Sure enough, they did nothing about it. And 25 years later, Japanese population started declining to the day. They knew this was going to happen 25 yeah. years in advance, did nothing about it. Right. So the US has the advantage <clears throat> of solid immigration policy, but, yeah. Canada too. but inflation and the problems of people being able to feed their families and yeah. the nationalism mm. that that causes and yeah. the fear of right. immigration. And all, you, know, you can see all these things get wrapped up yeah. um, and, and they can change policy and they can make people make mistakes and they can make me people say right we need to change our immigration policy because people are struggling to put roofs over their heads and feed their families and they're complaining that there's too much competition from foreigners for their jobs and so we can probably win an election by saying we will cut immigration right so there are there are all yeah. kinds of decisions that get made and in it's the heat a short-sighted of, decision yeah, yeah exactly right to your point yeah. so look the, the the world is in flux right now and, and it seems to a lot of people that it's happened very very quickly and suddenly mm. Everyone's like, what the hell happened, right? Yeah, Two yeah, years yeah. ago, before this pandemic, yeah. everything was great. And then the pandemic comes along, and that's kind of the, the, the tipping point. And suddenly, the world feels like an incredibly chaotic place when, the, a place. when the truth is, a lot of these things have been in place and been on a trajectory for some years now. Mm -hmm. COVID acted as an, as an accelerant, both in, in, in people's understanding of how fragile we are, yeah. but also in governments making a series of crazy decisions or from the fiscal and the monetary side to try and be able to afford to lock people up in their homes as a response to the pandemic. Yeah. So it's, it's just, it's, mm. it's moved everything on so fast. And, you know, mm. the, the, the problems it's caused with inflation, particularly, um, is a very tough one to get back in the bottle. It requires mm. pain to, to shut this thing down. And we're seeing it now, but we're also seeing um, a chance that inflation is going to come back to you know, 3% maybe or 4% yeah, this ad year. Advocating for pain doesn't win elections. It doesn't. Right? It doesn't. Yeah. So, you know, there, there, there's, there's no, the difficult thing I think for, for most of us, me included, is there are so many things right now that are in flux mm. and they're very big picture things. It's mm -hmm. not something, most of them are abstract concepts, right? Demographics are such a difficult thing to get your head around because it's a 50 year story. Yeah. It's about something that's going to happen in 50 years from now. Yes. And so people go, I don't need to don't waste care. time on that today yeah, because yeah. it doesn't matter today. Mm. So we've got inflation. We've got um, a, a land war in Europe, right? We've got China saber rattling. We've got um, instability all around us in our own cities and towns, in our own countries, and on a global basis. So it's really unsettling for people mm -hmm. after a relatively benign period mm -hmm. where they haven't had to think about big, pictures, stresses, nuclear war, right? I mean, I grew up in the 80s when that was, there was a specter of nuclear war hanging over us. Right. But for the last 35 years, no one has had to think about nuclear war. No. Suddenly we do again. Yes. Um, and whilst the possibilities are small, mm. they've well, gone from zero. The 1% chance is a lot. To whatever it is, yeah. yeah. And, and that's a, a change. So, you know, I think the message for people is, is understand that the world is in flux mm. and understand that you, you can't, look backwards 40 years and then project that forwards. Mm -hmm. You have to almost draw a line in the sand in 2020, 2021, somewhere around here and say, okay, that was then, what's next? What does the world potentially look like? Mm -hmm. And that opens up a whole lot of thinking to be done and a whole lot of reading to be done and a whole lot of accepting possibilities that uh, two years ago you would have said, right, I can rule that out because that won't happen. Yes. And that's what everybody has to do. We all have to think about these things, particularly if we're trying to invest money in these markets. Yeah. We're, we're going back to this age of personal responsibility and having to take responsibility of our actions and think through yeah. for ourselves what so, might hurt us. T totally. And so therefore, uh, with, with so many macro forces at play at once, it's foreseeably impossible to predict any kind of trend in the future for myself anyways. So I have to ask the question, how do I opt out of exposure, right? I look at the markets, 
tough to make sense of, don't really see opportunity, aside from a couple of very specific ideas that I feel like I have a competitive advantage at, right? Yeah. You look at the geopolitical shifts, again, very tough to forecast. There's an option on the table. Doesn't mean every uh, uh, Asian country is going to take it, right? That is fed up with dealing with the US dollar, but the option's there, and some might, some won't, right? But we don't know. No. We're going to have to wait and see. And so, you know, with so much volatility guaranteed, I mean, that's maybe the only predictable yeah. event is increased volatility. What I want to do is opt out of exposure. Right, and maybe that's partially the rationale of all the central banks that are stockpiling gold as well. Maybe they're looking for gold for oil deals. Maybe they just want to opt out a little bit, right? And so they hold the one asset that has zero counterparty risk, that for thousands of years has retained its purchasing power yeah. and held its value as an option on liquidity should you need it, right? And you know, last year I increased my physical gold holdings by 50%. Like I'm no novel thinker, I'm not a trendsetter. When I'm doing something, typically it's because I'm part of a wave, right? And if I speak to investors, you look at the markets the way I do, I know a lot of individuals did that. But a lot didn't and a lot won't, you know? And if I survey my social network that isn't involved specifically in the precious metals market, Grant, and you know, successful entrepreneurs who have made a pile of money, uh, market participants who have made money, you know, in investing in the equity sector, when I ask them, do you own gold? And if not, why not? And it's never come to mind as an absolutely acceptable answer. It's like, if it's 99%, it's, it's not. It's like 100% say no, right? Almost 100% say no. And when I ask why, it's very realistic answers, reasonable answers. It's I look for yield, I look for growth. Mm -hmm. I don't understand it, yep. right? I don't understand the precious metals market. So I want to spend a minute just discussing this asset class because I think that we shy away from capital allocation into things that we consider boring. But sometimes that's the best bet, right? And gold is a boring asset class. You can call it a pet rock, I say great, right? Like, you know, I had a good friend of mine who was looking to diversify a while ago. He bought a kilogram bar of gold, mm -hmm. right? We were speaking a month ago and he was upset. He's like, it's done nothing, right? <laughs> and I'm kind of in my mind, I'm like, that's the point though. Like, what do you want in a safe haven asset class? You want it to do nothing, right? To be dormant, retain purchasing yeah. power, and be what it was a thousand years ago, retain that option on liquidity. So, you know, it's a big question, Grant, but like, how would you communicate the utility and the value of gold to a, an investor with absolutely no exposure, and he's never even thought about it? Look, this is something I've tried to do over the years, a lot, and right? I think you do a really good job. That's oh, thank why you. I, I mean, I, I do my best because I, I look. No one has to own gold. That's the beauty of it, right? You don't have to own any gold, but there are plenty of compelling reasons why it makes sense to own gold at just about every point in the cycle. But mm -hmm. there come times when it makes sense to own a tiny little bit of gold, and it makes sense to increase your allocation, as you've done. And when and when when the world gets riskier, and when world when inflation picks up and when volatility increases, and when currencies are being debased more aggressively, these are all great times to at least consider having gold as part of your portfolio. And, and a friend of mine, Michael Weeks, um, said this best a, a little while ago in a, in a letter he wrote to his investors. He said, look, the bebeauty of owning gold is are the risks we don't take by owning it, right? And I think that's such a great way mm. to think about it. And so when you talk about opting out, and you talk about all this stuff going on, the chaos around you and how risky everything seems, Owning gold is a, way, is a way to opt out of that because you're not taking counterparty risk. You're not taking stock market risk. You're not taking the risk of bad management. You're not taking the risk of skewed incentives. No, that, there's no that, CEO who can get entangled in a PR right, scandal. Exactly. There's you're no taking none bank, of those risks. Value. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you come to the price. Your friend said it had done nothing, right? Which I, I presume your friend is either here in Canada or in the US. I would imagine one of the two. He's in Canada. Canada. Yeah. And yeah, to your point. Yeah. He's right. Yeah. It, it's done nothing. If he measures it in Canadian dollars, he's done nothing. Yeah. But there hasn't really been any turmoil in Canada. You know, you guys have kind of skated through. Yes, there's housing market problems here and what have you. Mm -hmm. But it's not been any real turbulence. The currency hasn't been decimated. There's been no real yeah. struggle apart from inflation. You know, now, what's interesting, just uh, as a contributing point to this, sure. he's Canadian, but he grew up in Russia. Okay. As the two currencies okay. will come into the conversation, right, I'm sure. Yeah. That's interesting. So... Had, had your friend been in Japan, he would now have roughly 80% more yen for his gold than he right. had a year ago. Because yeah. the currency's been 
smashed. If he was in Turkey, he'd mm. probably have double the amount of uh, Turkish lira that he had a year ago. If he was in the UK, mm -hmm. he'd have 50% more. So it, it's, you have to remember that gold is denominated in all currencies. It's not just a dollar asset that people tend yeah. to think about. Mm. So um, for the people in Turkey that held gold, the people in Japan that held gold, who were suffering from real currency debasement because of the policies of their central banks and their governments, gold did a phenomenal job. Yeah. And even though its price doubled, those countries, for the most part, particularly Turkey, saw a massive inflation. So it's not like they made out any better, but it protected their purchasing power, which is what it's right. supposed to do. Yeah. The other thing about it um, is obviously, instead of thinking about it as, as an investment, which a lot of people do, yeah. Once you think about something as an investment, um, you tend to think about it in terms of price. Mm. And you tend to want the price to go up because you're invested in it. Of course. Right? If you think of gold as just a way to hold your savings, as a liquidity yeah. reserve. Yes. So you're just going to, you know, instead of holding my savings in dollars, I'm going to hold it in gold. Now, that's the flip side of interest rates going up, obviously, because now you're going to look at your bank account and go, hey, I'm getting 4% interest on my yeah, savings account sure. now. Sure. So I don't need the gold anymore. So you've got to balance that out with the risk, but, but having gold as a liquidity reserve and, and having the ability at any point in time where you, if you're a Tesla fan and the shares do get cut in half to, yeah. to whatever, five, you know, 30 times sales or 30 times revenues, um, you can exchange your gold for Tesla shares. You don't have to sell your gold. You just exchange it for something that you think you're better off owning mm -hmm. for whatever time period you're investing in. And that, and that brings us to another really important point, I think, this idea of time preference is understanding what time period are you looking to solve for here, mm. right? If you are thinking to yourself, right, what am I going to do in the next two weeks? Yeah. Punting options market might be your thing. Yeah. If you're thinking, okay, mm. I've just had a kid and he's going to want to go to school in you know, 18 years and I need to plan for that, you're solving for a whole different set of probabilities here. Right. And so getting sucked into a casino-like stock market when you're, uh, the, the problems you're trying to solve for are okay. long-term problems is a really bad match of yes. time preference. Yeah. So gold is, a, is an eternal asset, right? You can, you can have gold, it, as you say, it'll sit there, it'll look exactly the same if you keep it and pass it down to your grandkids and their grandkids. It doesn't change. Mm. Everything around it changes. The, the number of people talk about, okay, I want to buy gold, which implies how many dollars do I have to give you? Yeah to buy gold, mm -hmm. when the reality is it's, it's the other way around, yeah. right? And, yes. and so trying to think of it in different ways and trying to think of gold not as an investment, but as a store of value, it will subtly shift your perceptions around what gold is and what it should be used for. Now, I'm not saying if you want to speculate in gold price, you shouldn't. Absolutely, mm -hmm. you can. That's what it's there for, right? You can speculate the price going up through all kinds of things, ETFs and futures yeah. contracts and all kinds of, there's always kinds of ways to speculate on the price. Yeah. But if you just want to speculate on price, there's a million things you can do that in. Yes. A lot of them way more volatile than gold. Right. Um, with potentially way more upside in the short term than yeah, gold. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but probably more risk. Mm. So again, you know, this idea of responsibility, this idea of understanding what our risk tolerance is, what we're trying to solve for. Gold answers an awful lot of those questions in a time where there's heightened stress, heightened volatility, heightened risk, yeah. gold takes care of an awful lot of that for you. It's not going to be exciting and you don't put everything you have into gold, No. Um, but it's going to do its job and it's not going to lose its purchasing power over, over the longer term. And that takes a bit of a shift in thinking the savings front, because as you mentioned, think of gold as a place to hold your savings. Immediately, I, I thought about my friends that I had surveyed and I'm like, where do they keep their savings? Because it's not in cash. Right. No, they keep their savings in blue chip equities, okay. right? That's been a strategy for a lot of people. That's been yep. a retirement plan, you know? I mean, that's what a lot of pensions do, right? And so it, it takes a bit of a shift in thought. And I hope that this is going to come into the conversation because if I look at a lot of like cultural trends, people are simplifying their life a little bit, right? There's a trend of people leaving the cities to live in smaller communities. Yeah. I mean, my wife and I did that, right? And we just want to be closer to our neighbors. We want to have a tighter knit community. For, for a bunch of reasons, but we really want to reduce our exposure to vulnerabilities and our dependency on, on things we can't control, right? For example, food supply chains, right? Sure. I buy my beef now from a ranch that I can walk to if I wanted to, right? right. Cause I'm not, I want to reduce my dependency, but I'm not going to become a homesteader. It's just not in my, 
right? Learn how to fix my car, do my electrical, yep. raise, a, raise, cow, raise cattle. Like, I'm not going to do that, but I feel more secure and just comfortable, more peace of mind if I know the rancher who raises the cattle. Sure. If I know the electrician that I have to call, like whatever the service is, building that into the community is a trend. And like I said, I'm no novel thinker or trendsetter. When I'm doing something, it's because I'm part of a wave. And so if we cover off like basic supply chains, you know, food, for example, if we cover off community and culture, and those two boxes are becoming simplified for a lot of people, gold is the version of that when you get into your finance bucket. That's how I see it, right? It's the primitive simplification of what money is. Right. Okay. How, how would you feel if I asked you to change that word trend and switch in cycle? Let's try because it. Because if you think about it, if you think about what, the world you're describing, yeah. right, which you're absolutely right, is a world a lot of people are moving towards. Mm. That's the world we had right, back in the 1950s, yeah. 1960s. Sure. And I think it's important to think of the cyclicality of, of the, everything that's inherent in being a human being. Mm. There is such a cyclical nature in it, whether it's birth and death, yeah. whether it's being young, growing old, and yeah. you know, going through that circle of life. Markets do this. There, is, there are cycles in every single facet of our existence, right? Mm. Um, and so that kind of brings us back to this idea of gold and its place is also a cycle. Like I said, there are mm. times when there is high risk and you want to own a lot of gold. There are times when the risk, like the 1990s, very low risk environment. Right? Yeah. Very low risk environment. US was running a surplus. Markets were booming everywhere. Real estate markets were booming everywhere. It was a very low risk environment. Sure. You don't really need to own gold. You could, yeah. you could take that gold, exchange it for real estate, exchange it for equities, NASDAQ, whatever you wanted to do, and do really, really well. And then we get back to the bubble in 2000, and suddenly there's a need for risk, uh, mm -hmm. for risk um, um, mitigation, and owning gold makes sense. So. This idea that the cycle of man is, is, is just that, is a cycle, mm. is a really important one. Because what it does, it focuses you on the fact that the answers to all the questions you have now may not be exactly in the history books, but they're all in there. All this stuff has happened before, somewhere, somehow, yeah. Yeah, all the yeah. problems we are facing and the decisions we're making to go back to smaller communities have been made by our predecessors. That's fascinating. And so going back in, in, yeah, yeah, right? And going back in time and understanding, okay, what was it like in the 70s? What was it like in the 60s? Which are the two periods that people are comparing mm -hmm. now to? What happened next? What happened in the 80s? Mm. How did we get from the pain of the 70s to the period in 1982 where the Dow bottoms out with you know, six times earnings and a 6% dividend yield, right? That's where the Dow bottomed out when no one wanted to buy equities. Mm -hmm. If you'd held gold, if I'd held a million dollars of gold and someone came to me and said, you know, you could exchange that gold Dow 30 stocks, they're trading on six times earnings with a 6% yield. I'd have gone, right, you have the gold, I'll have the shares, yeah. and I'm going to the beach for 20 years. Because I know if I buy them on those valuations, yes. over time, I'm going to do great. Yes. You can't say the same about 32 times earnings and 1% no. dividend. You just can't say that. So everything is cyclical. And, and mm. I can't stress enough how important it is to understand history. And you know, we spoke a little bit about this um, uh, over the last couple of days, you and I, but what's fundamental to the cycle of man is trust. You know, mm. money, credit, comes from the Latin credere, to believe, right? This belief. You believe that the person is going to pay you back. So trust is the foundation of society. Without trust in our neighbours, without trust in our governments, without trust in uh, institutions, what do we have, right? Mm. Every single person lives for themselves, lives yes. in fear, lives in paranoia. And you see this cycle of trust through, um, through the various kind of turnings, if you like, and uh, to quote Neil Howe and Bill Strauss's book, The Fourth Turning. Yeah. You see when there's a collapse in society, you see trust is broken. And it takes time to build that trust back up again, right? And then you get to this point at the top of the cycle where everyone trusts way too much. Yeah. And that's where we are now. That's mm. where we've been. Everyone trusts Elon Musk when he says he's gonna give you a robo taxi and your car yeah, is yeah. gonna earn you 30 grand a year, mm -hmm. right? And five years later, you're still waiting for it. We trust politicians, we trust, we abdicate our own responsibility for trust because it's easy and we don't have to worry about anything and we've been promised all this great stuff. Yeah. Gradually that gets chipped away and the trust erodes and you, and you see Donald Trump getting elected, which no one saw coming, right? Why? Because mm -hmm. people lost their trust in because politicians. Because there's fractures in that trust. It's fractures in that trust. Fracture, and once that right. happens, Hmm. 
you then get the COVID thing come through mm. and look at how the trust in governments and the CDC and Absolutely. vaccines and everything has just evaporated. Yes. And so you have this massive polarization and it's not necessarily left against right, although that's what it's kind of been turned into because the whole thing's wrapped up in politics. But the, the, the anti-vaxxers are people whose trust has been broken. Mm -hmm. They don't trust what they're being told. They don't trust what they're being forced to do. And it wouldn't necessarily matter what they're being told. It wouldn't the matter trust what they're being told. The trust is gone. Yeah. Whereas on the other side, you've got people that still say, we have to trust our government. Yeah. They're telling us to stay indoors. They're telling us to get these jabs. Yeah. That's what we have to do. Mm -hmm. And so what's happened is a breakdown in trust. And mm -hmm. it happens slowly at first, and it happens in certain parts of society, and it picks up speed. Because the things that you believed in, the institutions you believed in, the governments you believed in are proven to not be trustworthy. And anymore. it's probably pretty important that that trust fractures, right? It is. Because blind is. faith in any organization it's over exactly too right. prolonged a period is dangerous. It's exactly right. If you, if you, if you yeah. trust too blindly yeah. and, and you just give your trust out to people, uh, and again, so as we've talked about, faces coming at you on Instagram or through your phone, mm -hmm. how often do we instantly trust someone because mm -hmm. we saw them on TV or yeah, we saw them on totally. YouTube, right? Yeah. Oh, He's on YouTube, he's on TV, he must, be, yeah. must know what he's talking about. I'm going to trust yeah. this guy. Um, and that goes for me, right? Don't trust anything I'm saying. Listen to it, mm. discard it if you want. Mm. Or think, okay, well, I want to understand more about that, but don't take my word or your word or anyone's word for it blindly. We have to take back the responsibility for who we trust and what we trust. And that's, unfortunately, I think the period we're in now is this fracturing of trust. And as you say, it has to break, it has to be broken if we are to, to kind of crush the institutions that we can't trust mm. and rebuild them and rebuild our trust in institutions, in government, in each other. And that's a process and it takes time and mm. it's incredibly unsettling, but, but here we are. It's incredibly unsettling, yeah. but here we are. And it gets back to that thread. I mean, we've begun, we've begun talking about taking personal responsibility in the markets, yeah. you know, emancipating yourself from volatility if you can by owning you know, assets with zero counterparty risk, but it all comes back to taking control, uh, creating and defending personal sovereignty, right? And taking ownership, right? Yeah. And it, may, it might start with just thinking very critically about who you trust and why. Yeah. I mean, why do I just assume this is the way, this is correct? Exactly, it's, da it's dangerous to do that, right? It's dangerous to do that hmm. at a point of time where everybody is struggling and everybody is facing the same set of problems. So. How trustworthy are people or can people be when on the one side they have a family to feed, yeah. and a roof to put over their heads and rent to pay and groceries to buy. On the other side, they've got an audience, right? And that yeah. audience is the means for them to do this, yeah. to yeah. solve all these problems that they have to solve. This is mm. family, right? This is not some abstract problem. This is your family. You know, how do you know these people aren't going to compromise their values, compromise their ethics? Yeah. To, to, to do something that they absolutely is a fundamental need. Especially when things get hard. Correct. Right? And things are hard for everybody right now. So that's I right. think that's, it's, it's really important to understand that. I can't think of a better note to finish on, Grant. Oh, I think there are plenty of better notes to finish on. <laughs> <laughs> Very I think important. it's important. And, yeah. and, and, and you know, for, with the best one in the world, it's always nice to finish <laughs> on a positive note. Yeah. And I think the best way to do that with the context of this is, again, go back to these cycles, understand that having trust break down, having institutions that we trusted proven to not be reliable anymore mm -hmm. is a horrendous thing to go through, but you then get to reimagine them and rebuild them in yeah. a better way for people. In, in a way, way that it's you very can, liberating. Yeah, and, and you can build that trust up. Over time. It takes time, yeah. but out of the ashes always comes something yeah. good, and yes. we have to get through this period and onto that, and it's a process. Okay, I'm glad you turned us around at the, at the buzzer there, because similarly, like I am a perpetual optimist, and we, you know, we go down these, these doom and gloomy rabbit holes, but only because they're important to talk about, but I'm long human ingenuity yeah. and progress. I'm, I'm bullish on, on our species, right? Look at where we've come from, right? Yeah. I mean, look at where we're, as, as my friend Steve Diggle says, we really are clever little apes, and he's <laughs> absolutely right. <laughs> right. Exactly. We will find solutions to these problems, it's just, relying on it to be peaceful and calm and tranquil and no stress is just a really dangerous mindset. You have to be prepared for turmoil and volatility and then what's on the other side of it. Yeah, clever little apes. I love it. That's a better note to finish on. All right, All right look, man, I really appreciate you. Great pleasure. Thanks so really much. Really enjoyed it. This is Jay Martin.